Can the heat burn the calamity away? Well, as it turns out, no, no it cannot. But it can draw your attention to the searing sight of the subscribe button for the New World Review, the pressing of which will deliver regular JoJo content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. Hello and welcome to the New World Review, your source for everything anime and manga, and today we are flipping the whole concept of JoJo Monday, because we have a new chapter of JoJolion to review, and to put it quite simply, I refuse to wait until Monday to talk about it, because there is a lot of crazy crap happening here in Endless Calamity Part 3. And this is kind of insane, because everything I thought I could take as most mostly factual from the last chapter, has once again been thrown completely up into the air. And with this, I'm primarily talking about Toru and the head doctor, what is a stand and what isn't. And to start where we left off, going back to my thoughts on chapter 96, I was probably about 99% certain that Toru was the stand user and that the entire concept of the head doctor was just his stand at work. However, after chapter 97, I am significantly less sure about that evaluation and there's a fair few ideas swimming around in my head thing. But initially, just to address this though, the very first shot of the head doctor that we see in this chapter is pure nightmare fuel. It immediately evokes this Blair Witch vibe, which I guess spoilers for a film from 20 years ago. Seeing one of the characters standing in a corner like this was easily the most and potentially only truly terrifying moment of that very slow burn film. But artistically, this panel is so well done and it's through an incredible set of features. There's just something really nice about Arky's choice to have an almost completely blank set of walls in this room. I mean, there is a clock, but that's fine. You do need something, I guess. But the effect of these white walls more or less creates negative space though. And it allows this panel to truly zero zero in on the head doctor and present this moment from the perspective of the reporter with his laser-like focus on his subject. There's nothing superfluous in the space, so the head doctor's figure is striking and immediate. And I guarantee you if this room was filled with more stuff like I don't know, medical awareness posters and such, then this panel would not have anywhere near the same effect as it does. So this is very much a masterclass of simplicity and focus. And it's also a really cool way to introduce us to this new speaking doctor entity, because at first Araki obviously intends for us to believe that this is another incarnation of the stand that has been pursuing the rest of our cast. So it creates some genuine surprise when the head doctor turns around and offers his business card like any upstanding Japanese businessman. It was a great subversion of expectations that has now humanized and characterized the head doctor and has thus led me to questioning, I don't know, everything? The only thing I can really say with any certainty now is that it is clear that Toru and the head doctor have a connection at play here and quite possibly a connection through stand work. And I know that might sound obvious and pointless to say, but in the end, I feel like that really is all we know. Despite the fact that we've been exploring the stand for far more chapters than I recall off the top of my head right now, and yet we still know so little about it. Look, it's fascinating. Some might say frustratingly fascinating. I'm not one of them though. I love this mystery because it's just so damn compelling to read about and speculate on. Every chapter of Jojolion featuring the head doctor has fired up my imagination like any good mystery should. And in fact, I think this micro mystery is probably my favorite of all of part eight as it currently stands. But circling back to chapter 96, the accepted theory there was that the head doctor is Toru stand. And despite all of the characterization that he was given in this chapter, that could still very much be true. It would just be a more complex version of a long distance automatic stand like Jobin theorizes in this chapter. The thing about those stands though is that they generally aren't too complex in nature and they tend to have a very singular objective. And I'm not quite sure if I see one being capable of human interaction on such a subtle level of which there was a lot of examples in this chapter like that whole discussion about opening jars, potatoes and smelling things. But this leaves us with the idea that the head doctor is indeed an actual entity. And judging from how this reporter met his unfortunate fate, it would imply that he is also the one who generates the Calamity Stand. But even if we accept that, then we still need to figure out how Toru fits into everything, because judging by the end of this chapter, he does have some sort of direct link to the Head Doctor's actions. And one thought that came to mind is that perhaps all of this madness is a bit too much to be enveloped in a single stand, and maybe what we're dealing with here is a combination of two stands, one from the Head Doctor and one from Toru. So for example, let's say that the Head Doctor has the Calamity Stand, and that seems to inflict its abilities based on the condition of pursuit, which was directly referenced by the Doctor during this chapter. Cool, that's fine. But then what if Toru has a stand that allows him to replicate the image of the head doctor somehow, as well as the conditions of said stand? That would be a pretty ultimate combination and potentially a much more satisfying explanation than this all being the work of a single stand under the control of Toru. But I guess things just don't quite add up yet. If the head doctor is a stand himself, then he doesn't really fit into the established typings. I just don't think it can be fully cognitively functional and have a long range automatic use. Although who knows, maybe it's just plain overpowered. But except Accepting that the head doctor is real, then once again, Toru still has to be involved somehow. So why not have a dastardly stand combination happening? And this leads us to the whole thing about Toru listening to music during this chapter. Two songs in particular, Being Crazy Trained by Ozzy Osbourne and The Wonder of You by a certain
Captain Elvis Presley. And very, very notably, The Wonder of You was the name of the story arc that preceded Endless Calamity. So that may very well even be the name of Toru's stand. And what's interesting is that after the beginning of the Elvis song, it looks like Toru receives visions of Yasuho's current situation, which is writhing around in agony, as it has been for the last few months. So if anything, maybe Toru's stand is even more simple than I initially posited, and it just allows him to form a link with people through choosing a song to represent them, which does make sense in the case of Yasuho, because the wonder of you, you know, fits in with Toru's general feelings towards her. So in that case, maybe Crazy Train was the song that he chose to form a link to Jobin, or actually probably Mitsuba, because you get a close up of her eyes just before cutting to Toru outside. And actually, yeah, I think it does have to be Mitsuba, wouldn't it? Because Jobin still can't see the head doctor. Although, actually, I don't know, if they're two separate stands, that doesn't even matter at all, it doesn't even come into it. So that's interesting. Maybe Toru can do far more than just simply watching people. And through his song link, maybe he's able to project the image of the head doctor directly into people or around people, I don't know. And I guess that also does become a bit difficult to think about logically, because there are so many people being affected by the head doctor at once, and surely Toru can only listen to a single song at a time. All right, my head's getting muddled here, so who knows? Maybe he's nothing but a glorified sentry, whose overall purpose is to keep an eye on things and just provide information. And actually, having gone into the whole musical aspect, I am convincing myself more and more that the head doctor calamity business isn't actually his doing, and is indeed the work of another stand user. And that would probably work out quite nicely for the sake of narrative flow as well, because it gives our characters two enemies to defeat instead of just one. And it looks like Araki has made some clear group divisions. On the one hand, we have Yasuho and Jobin at the Higashikata estate to take on Toru, and elsewhere we have Josuke and Mamazuku poised to face off against the head doctor. And just a quick note on that, Mamazuku and Josuke obviously aren't in the same location yet, but it is interesting to think about how that needs to happen, because the problem here is that Mamazuku can't just follow the head doctor to find Josuke due to, you know, deadly calamity. So in a weird situation, he actually needs to beat the head doctor to that location, which is a pretty awesome and unique dynamic, especially if the head doctor realizes this, and then some sort of strange death race begins between the two. Having brought him up though, I do need to touch on Josuke because for the first time in what feels to me like forever, he makes an appearance, posing like an absolute Jojo boss in a chair. And it's actually really good to see our protagonist again because I'd almost kind of forgotten that he was in the story, having switched to Jojolion Monthly during all this madness. So I am glad that we are about to build up and kick him into gear once more. Not a whole lot else to say about Josuke though, just a super hype panel. But another major character I need to talk about is of course Jobin. The first section of this chapter focuses on he and Mitsuba picking up directly where last month left off. And man, he just comes off as so damn likable in this chapter, which is strange to say because two chapters ago here, I was certain that he was a completely irredeemable antagonist. But then you have the revelation that Norisuke isn't actually dead in chapter 96. And now Jobin has that touching little piece of dialogue, thanking Mitsuba for always being by his side and citing both her and Tsurugi as his ultimate reason for being. And it's all just so touching. I like the guy now. I like him a lot. And in a twisted way, I still do kind of hope that he ends up being the ultimate antagonist of George Orleon, because that would be an incredibly conflicting and powerful finale. Especially since he's still undoubtedly a bit of a prick, given that he was ready and willing to actually kill Yasuho. So it's not like he's redeemed himself entirely, but his chosen path is becoming more, I guess, empathetic. And that is what I want from my antagonist. And yes, of course, I am making the assumption that Jobin does live through this, despite the uh, hairspray calamity just tearing him completely apart, because I just think it would be the height of naivety to be convinced that Jobin is dead as a result of that. I mean, one of the things I actually kind of dislike about Jojo are the incredible amount of fake out deaths. And so whenever I see something like this, it's very, very difficult to believe that this is the end for a particular character, much less Jobin. I will admit though, he might be mortally wounded and maybe it will take some sort of, you know, fruit related incident to heal him on up again, one that might change him somehow, but he's certainly not dead yet. There's just too much to resolve about him to have this be his end. Plus, if Norisuke isn't going to die, then there's no way that Jobin is. Once again though, I did really enjoy this part of the chapter. And in fact, you know what? I pretty much enjoyed every aspect of chapter 97. Incredible stuff, really. This whole Endless Calamity arc is just such a super solid ride. As I stated before, the sheer mystery at play here is nothing short of captivating, and it makes me genuinely excited to read George Orleon on a monthly basis, which is something that, yes, I was slightly afraid of when making this transition. I should also say that at the end of this chapter, we got another time update till the harvest, which is now two hours and 11 minutes. So it looks like we've now traveled forward by just over an hour, I think, from what I can recall. I think last time we had an update, it was like three hours and 20 minutes or something along those lines, which was during the last arc, which is kind of crazy. Because at that point, we were doing the whole job and throwing 
throwing the phone in the toilet and drowning Elsa her business. So somehow between then and the end of this chapter, apparently more than one whole hour has passed, which I'm not exactly sure where happens because these events play out fairly back to back, particularly in regards to the Higashikata estate. So yeah, I'm not quite sure how that really works, but it's what we've got. And sure, why not? It's always exciting to move ever closer to the time of harvest. And I also want to go into Araki's message in this month's issue, which was very simply, I'm hard at work drawing, so you don't have to worry. Please continue to be careful, everyone. And I only bring that up because manga production and release has been affected elsewhere, specifically in Weekly Shonen Jump, which is currently undergoing a sore publication schedule, but it looks like Ultra Jump as a monthly magazine is not facing those same issues, which is a relief. And as such, I am greatly looking forward to the continuation of this brilliant arc next month. What do you guys think? Please do let me know in the comments below. And if you're keen for some more Jojo content, then please do go and check out some of my other videos or even subscribe to the channel for regular Jojo wonder delivered straight into your YouTube feed. But for now, this has been the New World Review and I'll see you next time.